I will briefly introduce, introduce Professor uh, Divak Malik, which is a pleasure to welcome uh, to Coimbra University, to the Center for Social Studies. Today we are hosted by the Student Hub, this new renewed uh, building uh, where normally the faculty of um, uh, medicine would sit, actually they are still around somewhere, uh, but uh, this space has been renovated recently, as you see the style is merging the old and the new. Uh, the facility is quite uh, interesting um, and so I'm also happy that we are here. Yeah. Professor Deepak Malik came all the way from India. Uh, normally he has invitations from uh, several places when he comes to Europe. He has, he has been lecturing in uh, different uh, um, international uh, centers besides many, many uh, Indian universities and academic institutions. Um, he is the chairman of INLANSO, the Center for the Study of Indian Language and Society at Varanasi University, India. Um, he is Professor Emeritus uh, at Banaras Hindu University, as well in Varanasi, and the Director Emeritus of uh, the Gandhian Institute of Studies in Varanasi as well. His focus is very broad, so it's not easy to introduce Professor Deepak Malik because, of course, I have to make a selection. Uh, it would take too long to uh, introduce him properly, but I just want to point to some of um, the main areas where uh, I'm sure he's going to touch also today. Agrarian relations, secularism, inclusivism and exclusivism, in Southern Asian societies, sociology, sociology and politics of Indian minorities, and he has been working with tribals or indigenous people, Dalits, women, religious minorities, and of course, Gandhian studies, where he is a reference. Um, his presentation today is going to uh, focus on Gandhi and Gramsci, uh, and in a perspective, this is a work that is under development and Professor Deepak Malik is planning to um, publish the book in several languages starting from uh, very soon in Hindi and then the book is going to come out in other languages so we are all looking forward to have access to it as soon as possible though we understand the complexities of this kind of uh, publication enterprises. And um, he has been working also on other dimensions of uh, the Gandhian impact on Indian society. Among them also um, an initiative where he has been working with the Hornell History Connect collection uh, of Narayan Dasari, that as you may know is uh, the son of the personal um, secretary of Gandhi at the Gandhian Institute of Studies. He also led a, a research stream uh, on the relationship between Gandhi and, uh, uh, and the left, uh, namely for, uh, in relation to Ma Mao riots and also the work of Bhagat Singh. Um, so as you see, when, when he comes here and speaks of Gramsci in relation to Gandhi, uh, he has a very deep understanding of, of uh, this issue, especially in Indian society. He has been very active also in the presentation, uh, in the participation uh, of the celebration of In Swaraj in 2009, the centenary of the very seminal book by the Mahatma, uh, in several initiatives. Um, among his books, um, I would mention Gandhian Nehru, uh, the shared inheritance of Indian inclusive nationalism, which gives a portrayal of how uh, uh, Gandhi has been very um, uh, important for an idea of a nation that is, uh, I would say, quite far from the nationalist patriotic ideas we have in Europe. Recently there has been a new parliamentary group created in the European Parliament. Uh, named after the Patriots. I think Gandhi has the opposite view of uh, nationalism and patriotism and this book uh, explores that as well. He's also very active in, the, uh, in society, especially through interventions in the media, 
and, um, and in many um, journals, including the Hindustan Times, Northern Indian um, Patrika, and many others. So, without further ado, I think uh, that we are all curious to uh, to learn with Professor uh, Deepak Malik between Gandhi and Gramsci, Civil Society and Hegemony. This is the title. I'm indeed grateful <coughs> to be invited by University of Columbia of Coimbra, uh, particularly by your esteemed department. Um, this afternoon I'm going to talk on uh, Gandhi as well as Gramsci, but mostly on Gandhi because I am sure that you must be uh, acquainted with what Gramsci was and how Gramsci was uh, navigating through the European scene in 1930s and the whole, whole decade of 30s, 20s and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that I want to say, sometimes people wonder, what is the relationship between these two people? How do I compare them? Mahatma Gandhi, who was a man of inner journey, who was a man who believed in truth. Of course, he, he redefined the truth. Previous definition of the truth normally in the texts was that God is truth. He said, no, truth is God. Uh, and uh, ahimsa, non-violence, and uh, of course, Satyagraha, which was his uh, consistent, which was his mode of uh, uh, resistance um, and uh, kind of initiative in which he thought that uh, and he believed that uh, there will be always a chance if you uh, try to emphasize on the truth of a particular subject. So, uh, and uh, of course, in the uh, final analysis, why we remember Gandhi so much, always, that uh, he created a sort of a new parameter or for our country and for our um, civilization, should I say. And civilization, when I say that it doesn't mean Indian civilization, it's the whole civilization as such, global civilization. Uh, in Hindi it is called, Sanskritized Hindi, Sarodharan Sambhav, that is that equal treatment of all the religions as such. Now, uh, this was different from secularism, this was different from sectarianism, this was different from compositude and various other, uh, 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 you know, initiatives that have been taken in the past. Now. Coming to uh, one of the characteristics of Gandhi, when he talks about truth, he is ready to accept the other version also. And that has come through his teaching, training from the Jain scriptures and Jain teacher also. And that particular branch of uh, understanding of philosophy is called Anekantavad or Syarvad. That is that others have also a view. You may consider this as final truth, but that may not be final truth. There is a different way of looking at the truth. I remember one, I shall be giving it in total, I'm, I, I, I apologize. Uh, I worked for about 10 years in Gandhi Institute of Study and I was connected with the Gandhi movement also. So we had a gentleman called Gora, and uh, his father, um, his father Gora, Gora was uh, part of Gandhian uh, retinue when he was leading the movement for uh, salt satyagraha of uh, it is called in English I don't. Uh, it's, 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 it's a dandy march, it is called, normally popularly it is called dandy march. It was just about a very small thing. It was colonial period of 1930s 
and Gandhi said, and that was the Gandhian strategy, that I will do something, we will just do something which everybody can do. If you, as a political um, authority, or as a person who is leading a community or a nation or uh, a liberation struggle, decides to have participation of only one party or a particular party or a particular group of people, that was not the understanding of Gandhi. He wanted maximum participation on a minimum small range of issue. So he said that well, the British government, the colonial government, uh, permits us not to take salt out from the sea. So we will just make salt, which anybody could do. And that is how the minimum program came, but millions of people joined it. Because it was such an uh, ordinary program, you know, you don't need, you don't need a, a gun, a steam gun and a revolutionary uh, salute and this and that and to fight out and bomb something. You just need to go and just make salt somewhere. So that was the Gandhian strategy, that was very important to him. That uh, uh, his objectives were very simple and very pointed out where maximum number of people can participate. The lowest and lowest, the most marginalized people also could participate. And that was there. And that he did in case of uh, uh, peasants, in case of because we were a caste oriented society, we still remain a caste oriented society. So uh, the Dalits are untouchables also, he picked them up. Muslims, everybody he picked up and uh, he brought them. Now, so this was a person, this was Gandhi, who would listen to inner voice and say that I am going on fast. What is the relationship between, between him and a dialectical materialist, Antonio Gramsci, who became uh, the uh, chief of Communist Party or general secretary of Communist Party for a very short period, of course, two years. After that, he was put by Mussolini in jail. Um, and he died almost in jail. He was released in 1935 and 37. Uh, he collapsed and he died. He was a sick man all throughout. He was given by, I do not know, I don't believe in God, but whoever it is, whatever it is, he was given hardly 44 years of life on this planet. But within that, the things, the whole movement, the whole epoch and era of 30s that he started seeing very critically, I think that was a very big achievement, that was a very big lesson, that was a very big uh, 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 understanding that whole world got through him. So he died in 1937 and uh, Mahatma of course was killed, Gandhi was killed in 1948, that's about uh, nine years after. Um, now, uh, no, more than nine years, ten years after that, uh, eleven years after that, <laughs> eleven years. Uh, now, what I was trying to say that how Gramsci comes into with the Gandhi, a man of uh, inner journey, a man who listens to inner voice, a man who is a uh, Basically, uh, he is considered a saint politician or a saint liberation uh, movement leader, you can say. And I am sure that if Gandhi uh, was not born in India during that colonial period, he would have become some kind of a religious personality and nothing else. He would have been that. But it was compulsion of colonialism that brought him into the day-to-day -day world of politics and very heavy politics of a huge country of a huge subcontinent. So, uh, how do these two people come together? How do I link them up? Or how do we then start seeing them together? 
One thing that I can say right in the beginning that both of them were trying to create a better world. Both of them were humanist. Both of them had concern of not only one particular mission or one particular community or one particular religious group, but the people as such. These were the kind of common points which we can find between the two. Now, we know that in 1926, Gramsci was arrested by Mussolini's police. And the prosecutor in the court said that, well, your lordship, and so we in India would call her the judge's lordship. That's a colonial habit, hangover, I should say. Uh, this man should be given such punishment for at least for 20 years his mind should be stopped. Uh, so that was the kind of rigorous prison to which Gramsci was sent. And he was already a very sick man. Right from the beginning he was a sick man. He, he was never a healthy child. Uh, and he landed up in Mussolini state and suffered through but this is the time when he wrote his classic uh, uh, um, uh, compendium, you can say, uh, prison notes, prison notebook, which was collected by his uh, uh, sister in law, who was in most of the time around in Rome. His wife was a Russian. Uh, she could never come and join him in uh, Italy, but uh, the sister in law came and when he died after that, in just under the pretext of collecting the goods that the dead man had left in the jail, she came down and she collected all the prison notes and that is how prison notebook has been created. That is a classic text for the world today. Many things in prison notes are very, um, you know, kind of uh, very vague, you can say to some extent, or, you know, new nomenclatures have been given. One can understand in Mussolini's jail it was not permitted. You could not write things as they existed. Like he coined a term called subaltern. Subaltern is an English language, English language, uh, an English term, which means some kind of a subordinate officer in the British Army, that's what it used to be. They were called subalterns. But subalterns later on was used by social scientists and all those people who were non-elite and were being oppressed and had a bigger constituency. It was not only working class, it was not only proletariat, it was entire community who were under tutelage of a particular type of regime, so support. Use that instead of working class. He didn't use working class. He had many other uh, concepts. His concepts of civil society, his concept of hegemony, um, I don't know Italian, but hegemonia, perhaps that is how it is called hegemonia. Um, all these were extremely new nomenclature in the politics and particularly in the political fragility of Marxism. Uh, now, one thing that Gramsci must be created for, that he almost gave a new vocabulary for the left. It was beyond Leninism. It was beyond Marxism at times also. I would not use exactly beyond Marxism, but Marx has left many things very unclear, very, many things in, uh, uh, in limbo, not explaining what does it mean. Gramsci goes into that, those uh, gap areas as such. So it was some kind of a jump over. It was needed. Somebody had to do it. Somewhere it has to be done, a jump over. So that Gramsci did. So from that point of view, 
he becomes a very important figure who gives uh, us uh, many views. But one of the things that I would like to tell upon also, uh, if I am permitted to, that uh, Gandhi and Ramji, both of them, believed in a universal practice or universal dialogue or universal context as such. Universal. That was very much different from what the post-colonials of today talk about. If I were a post-colonial, I would never be able to talk, uh, bring out this subject as such. Because the post-colonial will naturally go to nativity. Post-colonialism is back to nativity, away from universals. So, the universal that I am just trying to mention one of the very prominent post-colonial thinkers. Um, and um, <laughs> incidentally, almost three-fourths of the post-colonial thinkers are Indians. And even more of, out of that, 80% or three-fourths of them are Bengalis. Uh, right from Gayatri Chakravarti Shiva to Dipesh Chakravarti to Ranjit Guha and so on and so forth and all that comes. Whole lot of people they come. Now, would they call that there are certain universals where people cannot meet, where there cannot be a universal strategy or universal objective or universal technique of moving on? So this is democracy. Democracy is very much Western, European. I'm, I'm really extremely sorry that. If Dipesh Chakravarti had read a little bit of Indian history, he would have come even 2600 years back when Buddha was dying. His main disciple Anand asked him, Master, you are going to die. Give me some answers. What kind of regime will be the best for the humanity? Buddha said, Democracy. So, democracy was there. Buddha himself came from a princely family, from a, a small uh, uh, principality, which was basically a democratic principality, where things were chosen by, by rotation as such. I am sorry that Tipesh Chakravarti doesn't know about it. How come it is a European construct? It's a universal construct. It, it existed in our place. It existed anywhere and everywhere. The uh, other thing that he talks about is uh, citizenship. Citizenship. Citizenship is so much mentioned in our own literature of about 1500 years back. In Kalidas, there are Nagariks, Nagar, and not non citizens there are city states and so on and so forth and all this. This I am not saying that just because that we had everything. There are people nowadays who are ruling India, uh, by the way, uh, who claim that uh, Indians had even the plane during the Hawaii past. Uh, they used to fly on planes. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. We didn't have planes. But we did have democracy. We did have citizenship. We did have also inclusive regimes. Who? How come Mr. Bikwesh Chakravarti doesn't want to go and talk about a very recent and, and medieval history, not very really far away medieval history, the Akbar the Great, who created a policy of inclusiveness, who was an emperor, a Mughal emperor, or if you go even further down to 3rd century BC, Ashok Priyadarshi, who was the king of India, of Magadha Empire, who also talked about this. And there are writings of that also. There are, I am not talking on, on any kind of vague premises. There are evidences of that. 
how Ashok treated his citizens as such. Ashok became a Buddhist. He was the emperor, but his subjects were Hindus. Akbar was a Muslim, but his subjects were Hindus. So these things were not absent. These things were not unknown. This is not secularism, is not creation of only West. Yes, West has also come to that point. We had also come to that point at one some point. But there is a big gap in between. Somewhere there is a missing link where we lost it. That's a different thing. That question can be discussed. So I wonder, and then the person I am told uh, by my friend Amit uh, that in this uh, uh, <coughs> faculty, uh, I think Gaitri Chakravarti Spivak was also one of the speakers who had spoken. So Gaitri Chakravarti Spivak uh, uh, is also a Brahmin Bengali. He is known for one particular statement. Can the subaltern speak? Can the subaltern speak? That is a big question mark. Gayatri Chakravarti himself didn't know that in Indian history, in world history, subalterns have spoken so many times and very strongly. What is revolution? It's basically a subaltern, French Revolution, Paris Commune, and so on and so forth. And Indian freedom movement. Who are the people who were fighting and going to prisons in, during the India's uh, epoch, epochal uh, freedom struggle? These were the common people, the peasants, farmers, uh, ordinary people on the street, and everybody was going on in the jail. So it is not the subaltern cannot speak. Gayatri should have understood that she, perhaps she could not speak. When she, and I am talking to her about biographical notes, she has written that when she came to the precincts of American University, she was so hesitant. She was a poor Indian girl and she didn't know what to do. That is her business. Our history doesn't say that. When Gayatri was lining up for US visa, in Calcutta, I was standing in front of U.S. Embassy, protesting against their battle, protesting against their exploitation of Vietnam. So that is the difference. These people had no big ground into the struggles that have taken place in India at different point of time. So I do not think, and I would really like, I have I call these as crypto post colonials as such. And these crypto post colonials, they have helped American super hegemonic uh, uh, structure also. Because that is what the Pentagon and CIA wanted to hear. They wanted to hear that when you are incapable, you can't do anything, you don't do anything, you are incapable. And that is what they were saying from the very comfortable cushions of American universities. All of them are teaching in American universities. And uh, partly it is out of guilt of the ex-colonial rulers, of course. Americans were not directly our rulers, but anyway. So uh, all this thing happened that they got university position. And I think they had to coin some vocabulary in order to go ahead and get proper professorship, nothing else. Uh, so it is not a really a very great invention as such. Uh, and so it's the same thing I'd say about Edward Said also. Edward Said who claims that it is the colonials who changed the whole vocabulary and made the third world or made the colonial world speak in a way in which they wanted to say, I think also Edward Said, who is unfortunately dead now, has not read Indian history. 
Does it know name of William Johns? Does it know name of Asiatic Society of India? That was about 1792-93. Asiatic Society was made. And William Johns, an English judge who studied uh, uh, Sanskrit, uh, who knew Persian, who read almost all the religious texts uh, and worked on it. He and a couple of other orientalists of his time brought out a finding which they call India's golden past. So India had a golden past. Orientals were not only just told in history always, they were also talking about these things. And as a matter of fact, golden past thing helped Indian freedom struggle people later on. Because they got a little bit of confidence because that that went well and so I have also talked about this put the hand this and that. That we had a past. We are not doing something which we didn't know. We are not doing something which only colonials have taught us. Science, technology, democracy, citizenship, etc., etc. They have taught and we didn't know about these things. So, um, these are the things that uh, uh, Edward Said should also know. And there are some academics who have raised this question. There is one Azad Ahmad who is also unfortunately dead. He used to teach in New York English literature. Um, he raised this question also once upon a time that how come Edward Said also forgets that in India at least it is the whole idea of golden past or whole idea of having a, a big past in our history in our recorded history, we have gained some kind of confidence out of it and our freedom struggle has been much uh, richer and our people have got the confidence to fight about British imperialism and British colonialism. So, um, this whole thing about uh, the universals and back to nativity, Today we, in India we have a regime which is called so back to nativity and break out everything. They will say, well, I'm saying there's the universities, they are dismantling our universities also virtually. They will say, this education system, whatever the universities are giving, that's a Western education about this and that. Um, they have little chance of uh, they, 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 they don't lose a little space to condemn whatever was uh, created during the last colonial period of 150 to 200 years, uh, not knowing also just like the Vesh Chakravarti and Chakravarti and Chakravarti Spiva Gayatri, that India has a very big past beyond that. So I, I call these people number one, crypto post colonials. And secondly, not going beyond the colonial period. They see everything bad in colonial. Of course, colonial period was bad. Of course, colonial period was absolutely imposition of a regime which was not uh, welcomed or which was not consented, which was not necessary, which was which was absolutely abhorrent uh, incident in world history. But the thing is that. Uh, Everything that happened was not exactly uh, completely zero as such. There was some kind of missing gap was there between Ashok and 1868 or 1870. That uh, missing link was somewhat, uh, uh, I, I think, I, I should say that that missing link was rather re-established in somewhere. That was perhaps what happened. So. Um, since they are not able to go beyond the colonial period, they see everything. Democracy, that's a colonial construct, English construct. Citizenship, that's an English construct. Inclusive rule, that's an English construct. Colonial construct. So, um, I want to say particularly that they forgot that there is a dialectics also of the past. 
in the third century BC in India, in the regime of Ashoka, where he used the very instrument of uh, inclusiveness vis-a-vis his uh, subjects. And uh, so I call that uh, these people do not go beyond that colonial period. It is castrated dialectics that they talk about. It is castrated dialectics. And I'm very sorry that they don't have any information also about the past, which is such a long past before that also, and they have not been able to link it up with today. But when I find sometimes at Dipesh I need, by the way I can read Bengali also. So I have bought all the books of Dipesh recently, which he has written in his mother tongue. And he has written absolutely, absolutely reverse of whatever he talks as a post in his mother tongue. So this is the kind of uh, perspective that these people live. This is where Mahatma Gandhi and Antonio Gramsci come as a very big and important figures who do not, uh, who change almost the whole parameter of history, real, real parameters of history. They don't do some kind of pity for them or just trifle jokes here and there with uh, the guru of this whole post-colonialist, Ranjit Sinada. He died a couple of years, uh, just, just last year. Uh, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't want to mention him. Uh, but but uh, I, I think that is where uh, uh, these, these two people must be, must be uh, taken care of and they should be studied and they could be, they should be understood. Uh, no. Cutting short, because I have much less time now. Uh, uh, three major things that Antonio Gramsci proposed was that he theorized civil society. Theorized civil society as a brick wall for sustaining a revolution. As a matter of fact, he came to this conclusion brilliantly, I must say. This has never come from the Marxist, from the communist parties, by all this. He said that October Revolution will perhaps totter down, will not be able to survive because it doesn't have the strong brick wall of civil society behind it. I think that came also because he married a Russian lady. So he understood the civil society also because he had to live in Moscow in a flat during the 1920s as an ordinary citizen. Of course, the real privilege is being an Italian communist and so on and so forth. But still. So, uh, he understood the contradiction between the civil society and the October Revolution, which was claimed, which was touted as dictatorship of proletariat, which perhaps in the beginning was an experiment till Lenin died in 1924 and up to 28, almost the inner battle that went on in the Soviet Communist Party, in the Soviet Communist Party, and Stalin ultimately won over and started his killing spree right from Moscow trials to all these trials as such, where he killed almost all Bolsheviks who were Marxists. And by that, decimating the entire Soviet Communist Party, Russian Communist Party. Uh, to, to colorless, to cruel, to tyrannical bureaucrats who just were interested in the, in the name of dictatorship politically to rule Russia, a huge subcontinental country, one of the largest countries in the world, not one, but the largest country in the world, even now, even after they have been uh, divorced from their Central Asian republics, even then, even now they are the biggest country in the world. Uh, as a population, we are the biggest. In area, they are the biggest. So, uh, this uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, understanding that Anthony Gramsci developed uh, was very important assessment of October Revolution. You can call it revisionist history or whatever it is. But nobody had dared to say these things. Second thing, 
Brahmji is also considered a, a, a theoretician of for future, for future. He saw failed revolutions around him. The Hungarian revolution, which was very short-lived, the German revolution, which was very short-lived, and various other revolutions which followed October Revolution, on which Leo Trotsky was very much uh, enthusiastic about. But uh, Gramsci saw them failing one by one, bitterly, as such. So he could analyze the successful October Revolution and the regime afterwards, and he could also analyze the unsuccessful revolutions and the reasons behind it. So that gives Gramsci a very single advantage of understanding the whole process of transition, change and transformation of societies in revolutionary or in incremental way, whatever you know. try to go ahead with it. So uh, that is one important thing. There is another thing which uh, Gramsci very succinctly, very clearly, uh, change the whole, whole, whole parameters. Lenin used this, this particular concept of hegemony as a strategy. You must understand that strategy is a temporary thing. It is a war thing. It is used in a particular situation, I said. Gramsci told them it, can, it is a theory. Hegemony is not simply strategy. It's a theory. And by that, he demolishes the whole thing of state. Lenin, of course, collected it. Russian working class, the peasantry, what uh, in the Leninist the terminology is called the worker peasant alliance, but along with worker peasant alliance, which even the old uh, researchers that uh, have gone through, they do not take the, 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 uh, the, the struggle of the oppressed minorities, the oppressed nationalities, which were there in Central Asia. Uh, so this was some kind of a combination. This was some kind of an alliance which uh, worked out the hegemony and then considered them just as a strategy. Hegemony was created uh, in Italian, the Italian perhaps called it hegemonia. <laughs> hegemonia. So hegemonia was there. But uh, Gramsci told it is not simply a strategy. Hegemony is a replacement of the tradition of proletariat. Hegemony is an alternative to uh, 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 understanding the whole social transformation game as such. Uh, it is through hegemony a society can change and society changes. A dictatorship of proletariat will not, also not be sustainable if there is no civil society behind, if there is no hegemony behind it, hegemony. Uh, the third thing is that uh, Grand Rebound, which comes to the great Marxist area, of course Marx is silent on these things also, that is on the whole edifice of base and superstructure. He challenged it. He contested it. That there is no question of base and superstructure. This is an economic determination. If you say that economically the base is always basic economics and superstructure is created over that, so if you change the base, Superstructure will definitely change that kind of thing. This sort of understanding was there with the Marxists, with communists, with leftists, even with people who were not exactly uh, proper leftist by nomenclature. But say, I can take one Indian example for that matter. Our first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, who was definitely very much influenced by leftism, but. Uh, he also tried to do. He said, well, if we have five-year plans, if they go through, we'll solve all the problems of India. We'll solve the problem of Hindu Muslim, uh, you know, rivalry and communalism, as we call hostility between communities as communalism. 
So communalism and all these questions and caste system will also be demolished through development as such. It didn't. It didn't. So even Nehru was wrong there. Nehru was also deficient on those questions. So uh, Ramki had raised this question right from the beginning. And uh, he de debunked that this is economic determination, determinism, which really brings a weakness in and the whole, whole, whole mechanics of transformation of society, of revolution in making and that kind of thing. Now, coming down from Gramsci, I come to Gandhi. Uh, what was Gandhi doing? The, both these characters were in their height and climates during the 30s in some way or other. Gandhi, number one, I would call him an architect of the new civil society in India. We inherited through colonial regime a fractured India where Hindus and Muslims, the Hindu majority and Muslim minority, minority is also not minority of any small kind you can, you have to, uh, have to realize that. And so we are uh, at the moment perhaps first or second largest Muslim country also with the population of Muslims in our country. Uh, more than 150 million people of Muslims. So, uh, what uh, uh, Gandhi tried to say that uh, this civil society which was completely broken when he came back from South Africa in 1950 and those that he very graphically describes in one uh, of his writing uh, while uh, that uh, once he was traveling by train and in the, in the long train journeys in India for thousands of kilometers when you go you pass out in day, night, day, night so on and so forth Sometimes it takes three to four days to go from one end to another end and that kind of thing. So in the night he could hear, in the, in the day also he could hear, uh, in the platform, uh, people, vendors, uh, shouting, Hindu Pani, Muslim Pani, Hindu water, Muslim water. He said, oh, what a damn, what a damn country this is. Here even the water is getting divided into two religions, Hindu and Muslims. Water is water. So that was the kind of fractured society that he inherited. And he tried to make one civil society out of that. And that was 1920-21. That's his first movement of non-cooperation, where he makes an alliance with the Khilafat movement of the Muslims. Khilafat and non-cooperation were a kind of joint effort. Through Khilafat, he, he told, he, he has written about it also, that this is a lifetime chance when I can bring the Muslims into freedom struggle also. Muslims were already against the British imperialism because of Khilafat movement. I will not explain Khilafat. I, I hope you know or uh, perhaps you will be able to pick it up later on. Um, and, and the Hindu compatriots, the majority compatriots will also cooperate with them. So that was the first attempt of uh, making a civil society, of changing a civil society. Now there is one advantage and disadvantage. Advantage of Antonio Gramsci was that he had a given civil society. There was a civil society which was already made. In India, there were multiple civil societies, Hindus and Muslims, Brahmins and uh, non-Brahmins, and untouchables, urban and rural, class and class, the so on and so forth and all these people. So, these, to bring all these civil societies which existed in one subcontinental range, and to bring them together for freedom struggle, that was really a strategic decision by Mahatma Gandhi that he built up this unity of the Khilafat, which was primarily a Muslim movement, 
to save the Ottoman Khilaf Khalifa uh, uh, from the British domination, colonial domination, and build up India's freedom struggle and make it uh, 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 some kind of uh, a dynamic process. As said. It did, it did also, but it failed also. Of course, I need not go into detail of why it failed. A long, long discussion on which a separate lecture is needed. Second time when he tried to uh, uh, rebuild civil society. Now this is where he is doing a Gramsci without knowing Gramsci. Gandhi had never heard of the name of Gandhi. He didn't know what Gramsci is, what he is in. Of course, in his, uh, in his uh, magnum opus Indian Swaraj, Hindu Swaraj as it is called, uh, in Hindu Swaraj he has uh, one definite chapter on Italy. But in Italy chapter he mentions Mazzini and Garibaldi as two characters in which he chooses Mazzini uh, as opposed to Garibaldi and Mazzini is his hero. In India, during freedom struggle, there were some international level models as such for our own liberation battle. One of the liberation battle, uh, one of the models were Mazzini and Garibaldi, and the other was Di Valera from Ireland, who was fighting British Empire. But Mahatma chose uh, 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 Mazzini out of it. So he is close to Italy, but he never heard of Gramsci, he never read Gramsci, he never knew Gramsci, there was no question. Uh, Gramsci had very little information about Gandhi and Fidel Stel from 1930s of Italian newspapers. How much, how much information they will give about India and what, what is the need of it? Why, why should they be given at all? So, uh, in one of the very tangential lines, Magranti has mentioned that Gandhi is a leader of uh, resortment, which is again an Italian term, which is passive revolution or which is building up uh, a new society, a new instrumentality from top down position as a so resortment. Gandhi had nothing to do with resortment. He was doing something from bottom, collecting peasants, collecting uh, 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 untouchable Dalits, collecting Muslims and so on and so forth, bringing them, combining them in the massive struggle for India's freedom. So, Gramsci had completely a wrong understanding about Gandhi's movement. Completely wrong. Absolutely, he didn't know. So, uh, what I'm trying to tell that uh, uh, Gandhi took up these uh, very huge initiatives without knowing Gramscian principles, or he had not got read, or he, he, he didn't know about it. So there is no question. But th this he was doing. This is where I say that these are universal things. It is not necessary that you read them, you understand them. Through movement and through praxis you understand it. These are universal. These are bound to happen. Uh, in any country, in any part of the world, anywhere. So, um, that is what uh, uh, did, and then the other uh, big uh, uh, civil society reconstruction. I say that uh, Mahatma Gandhi tweaked civil society. Tweaking, you know, I'm saying it's just doing little bit of changes here and there, but not completely changing it. And what he did as opposed to the other Indian leaders or big social reformers. We had very big social reformers who rejected the whole caste system. We had very big reformers who spoke against the whole Hinduism and whole Islam and that kind of thing also. They were there. But what Gandhi did, he said, no, 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 no. I'm saying we need not condemn everything with them. These, these are people's property. These are resources of the civil society, which I'm saying. I'm, this is how I am. This was not Gandhi's language. These were the sources of, uh, of, 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 the, of the civil society. So he said that, well, look, 
I want a society where Hindus and Muslims should live together. And that is what is the concept of inclusive society. Sarvathana Sambhava, which he talked about, which he fought for, for, for which he was killed, ultimately assassinated. So, uh, uh, he did not reject completely those things, but he tried to combine. He said, it is good to be a better Hindu, it is good to be a better Muslim, it is good to be a good Jew, good Jew. it is better to be uh, a better Parsi or Buddhist or Christian than to be, uh, to be out of it as such. And they can unite and they can come together and they can be harmonized together in one place, in one uh, space as such. So uh, that's what uh, Mahatma was doing. So in 1932, he was in jail, Mahatma, and there was one award called McDonald Award, which uh, gave the untouchables of India, the Dalits of India, uh, a separate constituency. Uh, Mahatma sat down on hunger strike. On hunger strike till death. In jail. And he said, no, no, no. Uh, Dalits are also part of our community, Muslims as such. There is no need of going this. And as a matter of fact, I, from my own behalf, I can offer double the seats which the colonial Prime Minister MacDonald has offered. So about 70 or so seats were offered in the Legislative Assembly of India for the Dalits in separate constituency. Mahatma said, take at least 140 or 130 seats to fight, but you have to fight on behalf of all Indian people. We are not going to consider you as Dalit only and not uh, a separate constituency. Uh, but there will, be, there will be constituencies where only you will stand and others will not be permitted. So, that he did, 1932. I considered that also a very big event, from the point that uh, Gramsci always used to say that there is no hard boundary or there is no big difference or there is no big distance between political society and civil society. The civil societies are also made by political societies from point to point. Civil societies also influence the political society. Political society means state and civil society means private sphere and the, the, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, religion, education, language, all these things are civil society. Uh, so, your social uh, organism and all that kind of thing and uh, political society was basically state. So what in 1932 happened, when he sat down on hunger strike right in the prison yard, and he said that I cannot do it. The entire Hindu community in the country was worried, and the British government was worried, that if this fellow dies in jail, there will be revolt and nothing else throughout the country. And he had told that I am going to sit on hunger strike till death, till my demands are not really accepted. So a compromise was made, it's called Puna Pact of 1932, in which Mahatma said that instead of MacDonald award, awarding them 65 or 76, I offer double the seats and said, we aren't not I offer, but on, on the platform of the India's Freedom Struggle, we would like to have about 150 uh, untouchables coming to Parliament and deciding their course of action. And the British government, the colonial government, accepted it. Here, the state, as the colonial government, and Mahatma Gandhi, as the voice of the civil society, both combined. And out of that combination, a compromise was made. And this compromise really worked. It is working even today. Even today. There is a basic kind of thing. So this is uh, very quickly because my time I think is all to an end. Uh, I would like to say a little bit about hegemony. Uh, Mahatma's hegemony, well, 
Only with, with few, two, three uh, anecdotes I will finish it. You can imagine this uh, man with the. Uh, I am putting on a full. It is called Sundar Pajama. He, 1915, he came back to India. And uh, his, uh, he met Gokhale, whom he, was, he used to consider his teacher almost, Gokhale, a liberal politician. Gokhale said, Mohandas, Karant and Gandhi, you go around the country and see how people are living, and then you decide and do something here. You have done very good work in South Africa. He went and he saw that Indian peasants could not afford even a half dhuti, a half lonely sort of thing, and didn't have anything over there. Because it's, it's a hot country, it's a uh, tropical country. So they had nothing here. And what he had? He gave up his dress. He put on this. He had the stick of the peasant, of the poor peasant of the, of the village that he used to walk with. So it is not only simply changing the dress. It is changing the whole perspective of freedom. Right? He brought the poorest of poor the peasantry, the Muslims, everybody into freedom struggle through that. And particularly, I would like to say one thing. Gandhi was killed in 1948, 30th January 1948. It's quite cold in Delhi at that time. We don't have air conditioning. We don't have uh, central heating, that kind of thing. So it's very cold. So when it becomes cold, and you have to shiver. Uh, The current political power who are dispensation, governmental dispensation who are in power at the moment, they came in power in 2014. Actually it was their ideological, you know, perspective which had assassinated Mahatma. Mahatma Gandhi was killed by one of these people. Not exactly in person. Mr. Modi had not gone there to kill. He was not yet born in. But uh, what had happened that the ideology of hate Muslims, of hate minorities, all these things was put up in those times by Rashtri Sarang Sivaksan and Hindu Mahasabha. And out of that one person called Nathura Bhopsi killed Mahatma Gandhi in 1948, 30th January. 30th January 1948, 2014, 44 years passed. Of course, there were communal rights, there were rights between Hindus and Muslims, small, big, small, somewhere. But overall, India was still very quiet. India did not start a politics of discrimination. Politics of discrimination did not get a a party to get elected into governments, but in 2014 it got. So this is called Hedim. Even after his death, of 44 years after his death, he dominated the show, Mahatma. I remember one small incident, one small statement by Jyoti Vasu, who was the Chief Minister of West Bengal for 32 years. West Bengal is uh, Population is almost equal to France. So for 32 years left was uh, ruling over West Bengal. When Indira Gandhi died, uh, Communist Party, which uh, Jyoti Basu belonged to, CPIM, and uh, he had a left hand government, left alliance government as well. He gave a very cryptic statement, a very interesting statement. He said, Well, I did not know that uh, and, and immediately after, after death of Indira Gandhi there was the election. An election, uh, his son succeeded of course, but with a huge majority, unprecedented majority in parliament. So Jyoti Basu gave a statement, his party lost also. He said, I did not know that a dead Indira Gandhi is more powerful than an alive Indira Gandhi. So this is called if I, in an anecdotal way, if I have to explain it, this is the way. So, uh, these happened. Lord Mountbatten had a statement about Mahatma Gandhi. 
there were communal riots of worst kind, in the Muslim killing, going on in eastern part of Bengal, in Mokhari, and in Bihar, in Delhi, everywhere, all over. Uh, half a million people almost were killed in these things as such. Uh, Gandhi went, Gandhi went to, India was getting free. There was a celebration of 15th August 1947, but Gandhi was there where the communal riots were, where the killing was going on, on those places. He was sitting there. Jawaharlal, who became the first Prime Minister, he has, in his uh, midnight speech, he has mentioned it, that uh, when we are celebrating here our freedom, uh, freedom from colonialism after 150 years, our teacher, uh, our leader, is uh, with the people who are in trouble and he's not with us here in this uh, glittering Viceroy uh, Palace taking oath. Uh, Mountbatten after Mountbatten was our also first Governor General and uh, when Mahatma was killed he, he was there in Delhi as the first Governor General. He commented that Mahatma's death was able to quell, able to pacify the bloodthirsty Hindus and Muslims coming against each other, which with our battalions, huge battalions of British Army and Indian Army could not do. One man army could do, that was Mahatma Gandhi. And he could quell and he could bring peace in Calcutta. Nuakali, Patna, Delhi, and so on and so forth. So that is how, this is what I am not going to explain about it further, but these are the kind of uh, uh, perspectives that were built and uh, there are a lot of things which I, we could discuss about it, but I think I would just like to say uh, a few things, I know my time is over, that uh, is the French left hearing us they have not been able to form a government till now. I hope they take some lesson from Mahatma Gandhi and Gramsci. Mahatma Gandhi and Gramsci are not dead, they are still alive. And I very much thank you very much.